<laughs> in Mark 5, 21 through 43, God speaks to us in his word. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I even touch his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, Little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Anna. What an interesting story. Mark is the book that we're in. We're preaching through this book that's called a gospel. And um, Mark is not unique in that it tells the story of Jesus. Like it's, that's, that's not unique to Mark. That's not even unique to the four books of the Bible that, taught, that chronicle the life of Jesus. Actually, the whole Bible, Old Testament, every bit of it is about Jesus Christ. I mean, Mark tells the story of Jesus, and so does Lamentations. It's all about Jesus, I mean, really. points to him. But this book that God wrote, he, if you're not familiar with the Bible, God did write this book. He threw human beings... He wrote the Bible, and it's all about Jesus. And Mark is this intense, fast-paced account of the life of Jesus. In the Bible, there are four books, letters, that we label as Gospels. There's Matthew, there's Mark, there's Luke, and then there's John. Four. And the reason we call them Gospels is because the word Gospel literally means, well, both. It means truth and also good news. But not just like good news. It means great news. And so they're telling the life of Jesus. They're telling the story of his life. And they all are really good news. And today, my hunch is is that a lot of us who have grown up in the church either have never like come to understand the story of Jesus as being anything other than I don't measure up and a set of rules that I can never actually follow. Which sounds not only not like good news, it sounds like terrible news. Mark is a good news book. And this story is like, it is on display. 
Look, I just want to welcome you today. Like, I, let me just take a moment to say, given this, what we just read, given the reality of the Bible, it is highly likely that there are a lot of skeptics in this room. It's highly likely that there are a lot of doubters in this room. There are some of you in this room that want to have faith. You want to want God. And you just can't seem to figure out how to totally 100% trust in Jesus and trust in all of these stories. Man, welcome to the club. I mean, you're in a great place today. Actually, the point of Mark so far is to help you and me come to this reality. And the reality is this. Jesus is God. You can trust him. And he's way better than you ever thought he was. He's not just a teacher. He's not just like a guy that did some cool stuff. Teachers don't heal people. Teachers don't resurrect little girls from the dead. C.S. Lewis, this old author, had a quote that I forgot to put on the screen today. I'm sorry, but it basically says this. It says, you cannot call Jesus simply a teacher. You can't. It's impossible. If you know anything about his life, you can't just call him a teacher. He is either totally insane, a complete lunatic, or he's the devil in of himself. There's no way. There's too many crazy things going on. Can't just call him a teacher. Either you say he's insane, he's the devil, or he is actually God. And that's what Mark is doing. Mark is telling us, it's proven us at this crazy fast pace that Jesus is more than teacher, he's more than rabbi, he's more than that. He is God in and of himself. And he's here for us to display his divinity and call us to him. So hey, any doubter in the room, welcome. Anybody that struggles with faith, welcome. Today we're going to open this book and we're going to let it speak to us and we're going to let it draw out faith in us. And we're going to once again, imperfectly, we're going to learn to put our trust in the fact that Jesus is God. That's what we're doing here today. Let's jump in. The first thing when it comes to faith is this. We see it. In Jairus and the woman, there are always obstacles to faith. I'm going to read part of this story again, and I want you to just see what's happening. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with them. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. I mean, they were about to trample over him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians, the experts, and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and just touched his garment, for she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? <laughs> and he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. What a story. You have Jairus, who is this synagogue official. Now, just put a pin in that because that's a really important fact. He's a synagogue official, which means this. It means that he had a good reputation. He made good money. You don't get that kind of thing in that day when religion is king and when religion is government. In that first century Judaism, you don't get to that position without being a guy who said yes to a lot of things. He made money, his reputation is on the line, and he is a part of who will ultimately be the group of people that plotted to kill Jesus. They did not like Jesus. They hated him. 
Jesus was a threat to him, his buddies. That's Jairus. And then, on the other hand, you've got this woman who, imagine her cynicism. Twelve years of going to all the doctors, enough so that she spent all of her money. And as a matter of fact, they never once made her better. They actually made her worse. In that culture in that day, to have a discharge of blood meant that you became unclean. It was a scarlet letter. And when you are unclean, you're not actually able to even go into the synagogue. You've got religious leader, synagogue official Jairus, and this woman over here who was too unclean to even go into the synagogue, and all of a sudden, the playing field is just... Imagine all of the obstacles for both of them to even get to Jesus. The shame that she felt, the cynicism that she felt internally, externally she had to fight through a crowd. I mean, this woman is considered unclean. Anybody who would have touched her in the crowd, the crowd they would have been considered unclean. Jairus is thinking about his life and his daughter and who knows what. Doesn't matter. So many external and internal obstacles to faith, to trust Jesus. Both were facing serious scrutiny. Both had obstacles. But in this moment, I mean, all, all resources exhausted. <laughs> you become desperate to the point where you just don't care. You just don't care. What matters most, matters most. My daughter's gonna die. Take the money, take the job, take the reputation. She's gonna die, that's what I care about. Who can, let me look around, who can help her? Let me, what do I have to do? How, how much of a fool do I have to make of myself? I don't care, I'll, my daughter's gonna die. Dad's in the room, I mean, imagine that. This woman totally has every right to be cynical. It's, well, I don't care. I can't, nobody will talk to me. Nobody will touch me. People tell me when they, when she would touch someone in that culture, they would yell unclean. I mean, this is over a decade now that she has been labeled this way. At the, it doesn't matter. It, their desperation has them both after the same thing. We, where's Jesus? Somebody get me to him. You remember the story of there were some friends that had their their friend was sick and they cut off Jesus was in a house and they couldn't get through the crowd and they so they they literally cut a hole in the roof and dropped their friend in so that they could see Jesus. I mean, you ever been desperate like that? Parents, come on. Have you ever been that desperate? College student, I mean just any, kids, it doesn't matter. You've been so desperate to where it's like, I don't care at this point, man. Desperation leads us to faith. The desperate person is ready to do things, become somebody different, do something different than they've ever done in their whole life. It, it's likely that in this room there are some people who are, are comfortable with their money. It's, it's likely there are people in this that have either retired or make enough money to where it's like, we're comfortable, man. We're able to, we're fine. We, we're able to do what we want to do. And there might even be rich people in this room. I don't, that would possibly be the first time in the history of our church, but you're welcome here. There might be some people like that in the church. There might be people in the church that have, I doubt we have any trust fund kids, but there could be some where you just have never felt like financial desperation. But for the most part, even if you have money now, and you, parents, I, I hear these stories all the time. My mom was this way. We had nothing. I grew up poor, man. And the amount of desperation that sets in when you have kids, you have mouths to feed, you have people to take care of, and you don't have enough money to do it. All of a sudden, you become a chief financial advisor. You might as well give that person a master's degree. Am I right? Parents in the room, you know it's like counting 
pinching pennies and looking in the couch and she'd be like, all right, man, turn that light off. Turn that fan off. It's about to kill somebody because they won't turn a light off. I grew up that way. My mom is amazing, dude. She single mom, three kids. I was one of them. Imagine just like me alone, but two more of me. I mean, that was enough to, anyway, three kids working a full-time job. I mean, just unbelievable, which is a whole other issue, but I just don't think there's anybody stronger, more capable. You could, I think single moms, like they could run the whole country. They're incredible how resourceful they have to be. They're not going to make a lot of money. Emotionally, parents. <laughs> but not just that. I mean, when I was in college, I had to figure it out too, man. I'm not smart. I had to figure out how to study. The desperation, dude. You become, desperation makes you become something totally different. You can, all of a sudden, you can just do math better than you've ever have. That's where Jairus and this woman are at. It's, who cares? It's, we're desperate. I've, I've met multiple medical professionals now that are thinking about, they're, they're going two extremes, where they were just so in the middle, life is comfortable, medicine's comfortable, I make a good living as a nurse or doctor, and, you know, not a lot of people dying all the time. Now people dying left and right. COVID. All of a sudden, a nurse who's got to walk that person through, they're leaving this world. I met so many nurses that are just, all of a sudden, they're like perking up, paying attention, like, man, I wonder what happens when we die. Is God real? Does he care? Doctors as well. Desperation. Sick kids. Again, parents in the room, you have sick children. You, all of a sudden, you become a praying mom. You become a praying dad. I mean, it just, my point is this, it, makes you move past a point that you had never gone before. And that's where the temple official and the woman with the blood disorder, that's where they were, just total desperation. There's a story in Luke. Jesus tells a story about a banquet. And basically the story is this. He tells them, say, hey, it's a parable. There's a master of a house. He has put together this massive banquet for everyone. And he says to his servants, now go out and tell these people about, tell them they're invited to come and be a part of the family, a part of the banquet. And one by one, they all turn him down. One says, I can't, I've got other stuff to do. I'd like to, but another one says, I, I just bought a field, I've got to go tend to my field. Another one says, no, I've got basically other plans. It was people that already had a lot. The man that bought the field, that's quite a bit of wealth in that day. They don't come to the banquet. And then it goes on to, they come back to the master. They say, nobody's coming. Here's why. He says, okay, go out to all the poor and all the needy, all the desperate, and tell them. Every single one of them come to the banquet like they would. So now, all the poor and all the needy, and they look around, and there's still room in the banquet hall. He says, all right, go out to all the highways and hedges and invite them to the banquet. That is a story of the gospel. Later in Mark, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus. He says, sell everything you own to follow me. The guy says, no. Jesus says, I'm telling you, it's really hard for a wealthy person. It's really hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. I, they're not my words, man. How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, period. Mark 10, 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Full stop. Does God hate money? No. Does God hate you having money? No. Does God hate you having stuff? He doesn't hate you having stuff. What he hates 
is when money grips your heart and when your stuff grips you and now your life becomes about that and not about him. That person, it's so hard. And what he's saying is it takes a measure of poor in spirit, humility to realize I have stuff, I don't have salvation though. So the rich young ruler who's got everything, how can I be saved? Go sell everything you own, come and follow me. It is hard. If you have never been desperate, if you haven't ever got to the point where it's like, look, I don't know a lot in my life. If this has not been your thought where he's like, I don't know a lot. I mean, I can do some things. I'm good at my job. We've amassed this wealth. That's all fine and okay, but what I do know is that there is no way given how self-aware I am about my own heart and about my own thoughts and about the stuff that I have done, the stuff that I currently do, and the stuff that I inevitably will do because I can't break these sinful habits, there's no way possible that I can stand before a God who is perfectly holy and give an account to my life and say, I think, I'm, I, think I did pretty good. There's no way. You can know all kinds of stuff when it comes down to like just the bare bones. That one true moment you will stand before God in judgment, you have no chance. It's cliche. It's, It's cheesy, but it's like you can't bring your house to... You can't say, God, man, I look at my... 401k is pretty good. I gave away all this money. I've done all these things. I've, I'm pretty good. It doesn't add up, man. God is burning, face brighter than the sun, white, hot holiness. It's hard for a man who is not desperate, who does not realize his own sin. It's impossible for him to enter the kingdom of heaven. Impossible. Rich or not, you need a savior. You cannot do it. You can't. What are you going to do with all that sin? You need Jesus, man. Desperation leads to faith. You need to be desperate. Jairus was rich. The woman was poor. Jairus had a reputation, but so did the woman. Both were different people with different lives, but they had one thing in common. They were desperate, man. When their desperation reaches the point where they realize this, no one else is coming for me. No one else is going to help me. I've tried it all, man. Nobody's coming. That's when they bust through the crowd and leave behind their jobs and break all kinds of rules just to get to Jesus. And here's how Jesus responds. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Overhearing what they said to Jairus, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. I mean, this is incredible. Peaceful, compassionate Jesus. The result of faith in Jesus alone, not your stuff, not your works, not your whatever, the result of faith in Jesus alone, it overcomes fear, it overcomes the hopelessness that you have, overcomes shame, it overcomes superstition, reputation, skepticism, it even overcomes religion. Real, actual, not perfect, never perfect for the rest of your life, faith. It's the way of the desperate. Listen to me, doubter. Listen to me, skeptic. Bring all of that to God. Bring all that to him. God, help me in my unbelief. Help me believe. That's the prayer of a desperate person. I struggle to believe. I need you to help me. Say to yourself, I have nowhere to go but Jesus. The third thing is this. Jesus displays something to us. He displays his power and compassion. In Mark 4, uh, Jesus... And his disciples, they are doing ministry. The crowd's about to overthrow him. It's crazy town. His family has called him insane. 
Religious leaders have called him the devil. Literally, they called him that. All the crowd wants is for him to do something for them. They're just, just a consumer. And he gets away, gets on the boat. The disciples are on the boat. Jesus is sound asleep. The disciples are just awake on the boat because there's a giant storm. The storm is like not like this morning storm. It's like about to kill them all. Sea of Galilee had a lot of big storms. In the storm, Jesus sound asleep. Disciples are freaking out. They wake Jesus up. Jesus stands in the boat. He stretches out and he says, peace be still. And the storm stops. Jesus has power over nature. Later on, they get to the shore. A man comes out. They just like had seen this crazy miracle. They're going, who is it that can even command the waves? They get from the storm, they get to the shore. There's this man who's been bound in chains. He is demonically possessed. There's no other way around it. It's not, he's not like clinically insane. He's not this, that, and the other. There are evil spirits that are actually real in this world that have taken over this man's body, and there are multiples of them. And they, he has been bound in chains, living among the tombs, cutting himself for years. He comes running out. They just calm the storm. Jesus comes up to the shore. The man comes running out. Jesus frees him of his demonic oppression. Jesus has power over nature. He has power over evil. The next thing that we see is this woman comes up to Jesus through a crowd and she touches his garment. She's healed immediately of her disease. Jesus has power over sickness. And then this moment that is so amazing, he goes into the house. Jairus, the man that's going to be a part of the people that killed him, he tells everyone to leave. Peter, James, and John are in the room. Because Jesus stopped to heal a woman, this little girl ran out of time and died. And with her father and Peter, James, and John and this little 12-year-old girl, he takes her by the hand and he says to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. She was 12 years old. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them, no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. He has power over nature. He has power over darkness. He has power over sickness and disease. And he even has power over death. He is all-powerful and compassionate. I want you to look at this a little bit deeper. What kind of compassion does it take for God himself to understand the privacy of a situation, to understand the confidentiality of it, to understand the privacy of a moment, and to with love in his eyes say, everybody go, I'm not gonna add this to my Instagram feed. I'm not looking to get into the speaking circuit. It sure would be good for the other synagogue officials to know that I healed one of their own's daughter, but not worried about that. He, with the Father, in a pastoral way, because he is the chief shepherd, he takes this girl's hand, he heals her, he says, don't tell anyone, and then this last line is what got me. He told them to give her something to eat. I mean, she was just raised from the dead. And Jesus, because he's human and compassionate, he's worried if she might be hungry. That's sweet. <laughs> you have so many options in the world. You got so many other gods you can run to, man. You can run to a life of perpetual vacation. You can try to get all you can. You can try to love money. Try to serve it, man. You can run to family. You can idolize your wife, your husband, your kids. You can run to other religions. You can even idolize church. You can even worship being a cultural Christian. 
None of those gods are even close to as powerful and compassionate as Jesus. He stands alone. What God thinks about whether or not a girl is hungry? It's a God who loves us, who knows us, who identifies in our every need. Sweet man. So listen, doubter, skeptic, I'm with you. I'm like you. I'm just like you, man. I keep in my life, I keep thinking, well, I just wish I had just faith all the time, you know, like unbelievable faith all the time. And it's just not the reality. For the rest of our life, we're going to be continuing to trust and we're going to do it imperfectly. I read the Bible, though. I read this and I'm like, my goodness, what else am I going to do? I'm like Peter. I'm like, Lord, I, you, we've, we've searched around to look for words of life, and, but nobody has words of life. You have the words of life. Where else will we go? That's how I feel about Jesus in this moment. Even in my doubt, I still keep coming back to this like, I am, that's a real story, that's a real God, and I'll lay my life down for him. Nobody else is like him. There's another thing I've got to bring up. It's just so cool. Throughout the Old Testament, throughout this like Jewish law and customs ceremony, anybody who bled, anybody who was dead, anybody who had leprosy or whatever, they were called unclean. We talked about that. If you touched a dead person, you became unclean. If you touched someone with a ble- bleeding disorder, you became unclean. If you touched someone with leprosy or whatever, you became unclean. Someone in their sin, you became unclean. So every time someone unclean came around, people would freak out and not touch them. And if they did, they would yell unclean, and then they would become unclean. They'd have to ceremonially wash. In this story, you have Jesus Christ, who the woman with the ble- bleeding disorder, completely unclean in every way, she touches Jesus, and she becomes clean. The little girl who's dead, Jesus touches her. She wakes up. Guess who's unchanged? Guess who's not tarnished in any way? Jesus. So now, the clean touches the unclean, and because of the work of Jesus, we become clean. Sin is dirty, it's nasty, what happens in your mind in private, what happens in mine, what happens in our heart, the actions, our past, our present, our future, like all the stuff that we wish that we weren't, it's all nasty. Everybody's sin in this room, it's, it's not pretty, it's nasty. It's gross, it's dirty. And the good news is, you're not alone. Jesus comes as the only clean one in history, and because of him, The unclean becomes clean. And because of Jesus, his righteousness becomes our righteousness. That's the gospel. That's why it's good news. The story of Jesus is not about a teacher or a rabbi or a person. It's for every skeptic. It's for every unclean person. It is about God himself revealing himself. He loves us. And you can be clean today, man. You can be clean today. We're about to take this meal together. And for all the Christians in the room, for all those that have trusted Jesus, I want to invite you to take this meal with us. Um, If you're not a Christian, if you haven't trusted Jesus, or even more likely, it's possible that you've been to church a thousand times and that you're over-churched but under-gospel. That happened to me a lot in my life. So maybe today... Even though you've been to church, you know about Mark and all the Gospels and all the stories, maybe today your heart's coming alive. I want to invite you, if you don't know Jesus, if you haven't trusted him, don't come to this table, man. It's it's a meal of faith. It takes faith to even eat this meal together. But it's still like, let's talk. There are people that brought you, there are people that are around you that would love to talk with you. I would love to talk with you. Let's talk about Jesus.